All right, so welcome to class again. I hope you have had a nice weekend. Last time we finished on a note regarding curve integrals of vector fields. So previously we had introduced curves, then we introduced integrals of functions along curves. And the next concept we introduce is that we discuss in more detail is very important in physics and so also in engineering, namely it's curve integrals of vector fields. So that's a very important fundamental topic. And let's start with an example. Some motivation. So suppose a train moves along a path or a curve, gamma, which we parameterize from A to B. But as the, as the train moves on, it's subject to wind. So while it moves, there's wind that flows along a certain vector field F. It's a vector field, so we have a two-dimensional setting here. So the vector field goes from R to the 2 to R to the 2. Now the question is, OK, what energy is needed by the train to move along this, by a loop to move along the tracks? What energy is needed to move along the tracks? So if emerging you as a train, and if the wind, for example, blows straight in against you, you need, you need to um, spend energy. You sp need to spend work in order to counter that, counter that effect. You need to accelerate against the wind. By contrast, if the wind blows behind you, if it, goes from, if it flows from your back, then you get some extra acceleration. And in this model here, in this very simplified setting, if the wind blows from the side, then we, mo we model it as ha having no effect on you. So let's suppose, let's say we move along some curve. Those are the train tracks now. We model it as a one-dimensional line. And you are a train. Some Swiss train, of course. Let's say we model it also as a point. So this is your position at time t. OK. There's some wind blowing. And let's say it moves in this direction only. OK. What is, what is important here is to decompose the wind into basically two components. Let's say you're here. Then we decompose the wind into a tangential component. Let's say that is a vector field. <coughs> then on the one hand, we have got a tangential component. And let's say we also have got a normal component, an orthogonal component, orthogonal to the train tracks. That's a parallel component parallel to the curve direction. In this setting, it means tangential. That is important for your acceleration. By contrast, the other component, normal or orthogonal component, will not matter. This will not matter for your acceleration. So we would like to know, OK, if we, as we move along the, ent the entire track from A to B, from the starting point to the end. What is the entire work that needs to be done in order to act against the wind? Or perhaps even the wind supports us. We have some less en energy to spend. That can be modeled by cur curve integrals of vector fields. The energy needed along the travel, or along the ride, It's modeled by a, curve in, by a curve integral of this vector field F along the trajectory, along the path. OK, that's what we're going to do. That's a physical background. And now we start with a bit of mathematic, mathematics, of course. 
So what is the curve integral of a vector field now in, in calculation terms, in mathematical terms? So given a curve, start with the most basic things. If you need curve integrals, we need to start with a curve, obviously. You have a curve and a vector field. And let's call the vector field just f, as usual. Goes from r to the n into r to the n. We now define the curve integral as follows. So we have this integral from big gamma from the curve of the vector field dl. That's what we call the curve integral and what it means in the what it means mathematically is the following. We integrate from A to B the following object, namely the vector field F at T Well, that's a vector field. We would like to integrate only functions, and so we integrate it against the tangential vector. Keep in mind, this guy here is a scalar product, scalar or dot product of two vectors. Okay, so what we have here on the right-hand side, what we have here is just the, now the integral of a function over some interval. That's something we can work with. And to be a bit more explicit, we can also write it as an integral of the following. We take the first component of f at gamma t, multiplied with the first component of the tangential vector. So first component, first component of the tangential vector, and so on. Second com we multiply the second components, and the end, we multiply the nth components. So we multiply fn. Uh, fn at gamma t, and the, tangent, the tangential vector dot gamma, the nth component. OK, are there further questions? OK, yeah, with components, we, we skip the arrows. OK, um, that's the basic definition of the curve integral of a vector field. Now, let's take a look at a few examples. First, a few conceptual examples, and then a computational example. So there are a bunch of interesting vector fields, and one of the most interesting vector fields are the gradients. Arguably, okay, if you've got a vector field that is a, that is a gradient of some, of some function, then typically you can, prove some interest, you can show some interesting things. Let's do take a look at the following, which also connects to some concepts in physics. Suppose we have got a vector field F. And this vector field, in fact, is a gradient of some function. That got a special name, actually. You find it in, in every physics book. You find it as follows. We call f the potential function, the potential function of the vector field f. OK, if a vector field has got a potential function, that is, it is a gradient of something, then for every curve integral, the following happens. So we got a curve integral along some curve gamma of this gradient field F. OK, what is that? By definition, by definition, it's the integral from A to B of the gradient at gamma t. And then we take the dot product, the product of two vectors, with the tangential. Now, if you take a look here, you've got the gradient of f at gamma t multiplied with the derivative. Now, we make one observation. And if you're a bit, if you're a bit more familiar with, um, with calculus, you immediately see what has happened here. Namely, this is an application of the chain rule. We use the chain rule. And then we see, OK, what's, what we integrate there. It's still an integral from A to B, but we can write it as f gamma t derivative at 
at t, dt. The best way of seeing this is just, okay, take f, compose this gamma, and then you just take the derivative and see what happens. Then you will recognize, okay, those two integrals are just the same. But now we can use, okay, we have an integral of a derivative. It's just an integral of a derivative. So you can just use the fundamental theorem of calculus. That gets us f at gamma b minus f at gamma a. So an there's, one interesting observation, there's one interesting observation here, namely the value of this curve integral of this, vect of this vector field, of this gradient, apparently only depends on the endpoints A and B. So one more term terminology that you will encounter later in life, F is a conservative vector field. It's one more piece of terminology. <clears throat> and the big observation here is, if f is a gradient, then this curve integral of this gradient, it will only depend on the endpoints of the curve. It's a really nice observation if we have got an integral of a gradient, a curve integral of a gradient along some curve we only need to take a look at what are the values of the potential at the endpoints. Arguably, it's quite helpful. I would like to discuss another example that is inspired from physics and that relates to kinetic energy. Let F be a force field. which accelerates a particle. As the particle gets accelerated by this force field, it starts to move. And by a fundamental law of physics, it obeys a differential equation. The path gamma satisfies the differential equation given as follows. The second derivative in time of gamma t equals the vector field f at the position at time gamma t. Now on the left hand side we got the acceleration and on the right hand side we got the force. Since I am a mathematician, I do not care about units here at this point. A physicist might recognize that this is just a basic form of Newton's law of mechanics. Acceleration is proportional to force. Now let's take this and see what happens. For example, I can take this differential equation and multiply both sides by the speed vector of gamma. On the left hand side I get the second derivative of gamma times the first derivative of gamma and on the right hand side f of gamma t multiplied with the vector well, first derivative of gamma. And both sides are just to have a scalar product. And now let's integrate. I integrate, let's say, from A to B on the left. And I integrate on the right, again from A to B. On the right hand side, I integrate the vector field at gamma t times the uh, tangent vector of gamma, the tangent vector at time t. So I already recognize that the integral of the vector field f along the curve gamma from a to b. Now let's take a look at the left hand side. 
on the left hand side. If I take a look at the integrand here, I see I can actually rewrite it as follows. The integral from A to B of the derivative of the derivative of gamma times the derivative of gamma. First, I've switched here from the dot notation for derivatives to the prime notation for derivatives, because that's more convenient, It's in, at least in this expression. So inside the bracket, we got gamma t scalar product with gamma t. Inside the bracket, we've got the tangent vector times itself as a scalar product. And of that, we take the derivative. Now, if I apply the product rule, for example, what you can do is you can write out this dot product and just apply the product rule to each summand. Then you see that this actually indeed equals the integral of the second derivative of gamma times the first derivative of gamma. So these two integrals are the same. But now I can just apply the fundamental theorem of calculus. And switching back to the dot notation for derivatives, out of convenience, we get one half of gamma dot b square. Now I can apply the fundamental theorem of calculus again. We get one half tangent vector at b multiplied tangent vector at b minus one half tangent vector at a multiplied with tangent vector at a. Or in other words, one half the size of the tangent vector at b squared minus one half the size of the tangent vector at a squared. Let me move this just for the sake of illustration, just so it looks nicer. So if we take a look here at the very end, essentially that's the difference in kinetic energy. This curve integral, the curve integral, if we let the particle move in accordance with this vector field, let's say from time t equal a up to time t equal b, then the curve integral of this, of this force vector field f along the trajectory of the path, along the trajectory of the particle, will give us a difference in kinetic energy at the start time versus the end time. We get the kinetic energy at the end time, t equal b, minus the kinetic energy at the start time, t equal a. Those are, have been a few conceptual examples. There will be a few exercises on that, for that on the next exercise sheet, and then it will all be more familiar to you. Let's do one calculation now. Let's say we've got our vector field F given in X and Y. Let's call it X and Y here given as minus y and x. So again, we remember this was this rotational vector field. And we got a curve that we've seen before. We got the curve, let's say, from 0 to 2 pi. Again, just going into r to the 2. And we know it very well. It's just the curve of cosinus of t sine of t. So again, it's just the parameterization of the unit circle. You run around the unit circle counterclockwise. Just that. Okay, we would like to f uh, compute the following curve integral.
just a good practice. We take f along the curve integral gamma, along the curve gamma. So by definition, what is a curve integral by definition? It's an integral from 0 to 2 pi. of the vector field f at gamma t times the tangential vector, gamma dot t. Then on the one hand, we got two things now. If you plug in values, then, OK, we integrate from 0 to 2 pi. OK. F takes gamma, switches coordinates, and puts a minus in front of the first component. So what we have is here minus sine of t and cosine of t. That's the first, first vector field. And if we now take a look at the tangential vector field, OK, we just take derivatives in each component and we happen to get the same guy, the same vector field. Okay, it takes the dot product now. It takes the product of both vectors and just sine of t square plus cosine of t square integrated from 0 to pi. So we integrate in from 0 to 2 pi. And the result is just 2 pi. OK, that's one simple calculation. Some, some simple vector field along some simple curve. In fact, it's simple, a simple curve in a very rigorous sense. It does not self-intersect. But we can also make some observation now. The curve, well, it's simple, regular, it's differentiable, all we, would ask, all we could ask for. And in particular, it's also a closed curve, which means the endpoints of the curve, which means the endpoints of the curve are the same. That observation actually tells us something about the vector field. Namely, f is not a gradient. Yeah? It's, a clo it's closed. <laughs> Namely, OK, maybe in the last few minutes we can think about why is this not a gradient. So we know that gamma a is equal to gamma b. It's a closed curve, so the endpoints do agree. If f were a gradient, then this curve integral, then this curve integral would be, OK, if it were a gradient, then we would take f gamma b minus f gamma a, which in the case of a, of a closed curve, well, got two, two times the same points. And it would just be 0. But here we see, OK, the calculations have, sh the calculations have shown us that this vector field cannot be a gradient. It's a, the integral is non-zero. That can be visualized, on the one hand, by this flow vector field here. If you've got this rotational vector field, You can tell it's not a gradient because if it were a gradient, OK, you, would move, you could move in a circle. And then it would be, it's like you move, a, you move in, a, in, a, in a mountain range. You move along a circle. And you get out at, at a point higher than you started. If it were a gradient, that, if the ve that vector field were a gradient, then something like this on the right-hand side there could happen in the real life. Okay, let's think about this during the break.
All right, then let's, having thought about this a bit, let's continue. And in fact, let's just finish the discussion of curve integrals and in fact, curves in general, at least for now. Of course, of course, we will encounter curves over and over again from here on. So let's do a short summary and outlook. So, so far we have had a very simple setting where we have got some differentiable curve. It may be closed or may have different starting and endpoints. But I guess in particular for engineers, not everything is smooth. You all, you, again and again, you will use uh, things that are not smooth, but maybe piecewise smooth. Piecewise smooth. So let's discuss this in brief. So instead of simple, regular, differentiable curves, that is a simple setting, the easy setting, we will often use, curve, use curves that are simple and piecewise regular differentiable. Piecewise regular differentiable. That's only a little difference, I would say, for practical purposes, for calculations. So what does it look like? I think it's easiest to do a picture. Maybe you've got a curve starting at A. The parameter starts at A. Then at some point, we take a sharp twist. Maybe at parameter B, we take a sharp twist, get to some, and then we move on until parameter C. And then again, we do another sharp twist. <laughs> Move and move on to some parameter D. So what is that here? This shows a simple curve. A simple curve, let's call it gamma from A to D. The parameter interval is from A to D, and it's, it goes into R to the 2. Well, as you can tell, it's not everywhere differentiable. At this points, at this points B and C, it takes a sharp twist. So we cannot, take, we cannot talk about the derivative there. That curve is regular and differentiable to open intervals. That is, over the interval first from A to B, then from B to C, and from C to D. You can tell, you move smoothly from the parameter A until you reach parameter B, everything's fine. Then you move smoothly from parameter B until parameter C, then you move smoothly again from parameter C to parameter D. Okay, and the most important thing here is how to do curve integrals. That is very straightforward. If, for example, you've got a curve integral over this curve gamma, let's call this guy gamma. If you've got this curve integral, let's say, of some function dl, f dl, Okay, we know how to do that if the curve integral, if the curve is smooth, and if it is piecewise smooth, we just decompose the integral now. This is how you do it. You would take the integral from A to B, the so first subinterval, so you integrate from A to B, F gamma t times the speed, then unsurprisingly, you integrate from B to C. That's the next subinterval, and I should write dt's here, from b to c, and then you integrate from c to d. You integrate from c to d, f gamma t times the speed. So it's a very, I think, straightforward generalization. Again, there will be a few exercises over the next week. Okay. That's only a small modification, and once you have, if you're gi given a curve that tells you, okay, it goes smoothly from A to B, 
then smoothly from B to C, then it's straightforward to integrate to compute curve integrals using such a curve. Okay, then, to summarize what has been important so far, we had curves. We had some basic definitions regarding curves, like what is a simple curve, what is a closed curve, differentiable and regular curves. In particular, there was this tangent vector, which is very, very important. The second topic, then, that was the first part. The second part were curve integrals of functions. So it's important, okay, you integrate a function along a curve. I'd say the most important thing is that you know the definition. Obviously, that's very important to know the definition of the curve integral. And then we have had a few observations. For example, you might, want, you might have seen, okay, if I have different parameterization of the same, of the same curve, then the integrals are the same. In fact, let me write this explicitly. Different parameterizations, gamma, little gamma, of the same curve, big gamma, gives the same integral. On the exercises today, you've, had, you've seen also an example where you go from A to B on different curves. The first example was either you go in a straight line or you go in an arc. Well, you get different integrals because those are different curves. It's like if you drive from, let's say, Lausanne to Zurich, if you take the highway, then the gas consumption along the highway, along the highway will be different than if you draw, if you instead go over Zion and then over Graubünden. It will be a different path, a different curve, and, for example, the integral of the gasoline consumption will be different. Very natural. The third topic were curve integrals of vector fields. Now, as for, for now, for now, curve integrals of functions and curve integrals of vector fields are completely different things. We will see, later see a connection between them. Again, the most important thing is keeping in mind the definition so we can actually start computing with them. And then a little extra inside was, well, let's make it a star. We discussed conservative vector fields very briefly. In fact, later on, a bit later during this class, we'll also make it a major topic. Conservative vector fields are quite important. Conservative vector fields are quite important in physics and so also in engineering. So this will be an extra section at some point. Okay. Next, we talk again about integrals. Not along curves, but we will actually set up a relation between integrals over volumes, or in this case over areas, and integrals over curves. That will be the next slides. Okay, <clears throat> we've had the definition of curve integrals, and now what follows are a bunch of big theorems, a bunch of important results in vector calculus. Important results include, for example, the divergence theorem and Green's theorem, and we will discuss them first in the two-dimensional setting. Later on, we will also discuss integrals over three-dimensional volumes, and Stokes' theorem and some, relate, and some related results. Okay, so what is the whole point of Green's theorem? What is the whole point of the following discussion? So in this part, we show that certain integrals over two-dimensional domains, over two-dimensional domains, omega, we call them omega, those are subsets of R to the two, we can express them as line integrals. Can be written as line integrals. Along what? Along which lines? The boundary of the domain. Along the boundary del omega. Let's do a picture. So we got some domain, omega, and 
What is the boundary of omega? Well, quite physically, it's a boundary as you see it here, and it can be written as a curve. So, we've got this boundary here, and we can write the boundary always as a curve in our examples. This boundary is always, you know, we always make, we use the following convention. The boundary is always in counterclockwise direction. So, we have some curve, let's call it gamma, from A to B. And that parameterizes the boundary. Is a closed, simple curve that parameterizes the boundary. So we pick some starting point, we move along in your direction. We pick some starting point, we move in counterclockwise direction. Always in counterclockwise direction here until we, reach the, until we have closed up the, the domain. And the whole point is that, we, that some integrals over big omega, over omega here, can be expressed as curve integrals along the boundary. One, one result being the following, which is known as Green's theorem. It's the integral of the curl of f over the domain. So that integral lives inside the domain. And that can be written as the boundary integral along the boundary of the same vector field. In this case, actually it's a curve integral of a vector field. Okay, so the best thing now is to start first talking, is first to talk about what are domains. Because, okay, we obviously, in order to talk about integrals over domains, we need to introduce domains in the first place. So let's go over that. And for our purposes, a domain, omega, in R to the n, n will be equal to in what follows, but generally speaking, it's a bounded open set. It's an open bounded set. Examples for that include boxes, disks, or polygons. So a box, disk, or maybe just a polygon. So that's what the domains will look like. Yeah, please. Okay, bounded means that like it's not infinite; it's contained in in somewhere. Open is um is is um I think something you should have encountered in analysis two. Let's say technically it means that like open means if you've got a point inside the domain, you can always zoom in so you only see the inside of the domain. That's the informal, informal definition. We will not use it. We will not use open, let's say, in a very technical manner. It's just, some, just so we have got a correct definition here. Now, we will use domains in R to the 2. We will use domains omega in two-dimensional space that are bounded by a simple closed curve. Simple, closed, and piecewise regular curve that runs in counterclockwise direction. Counterclockwise direction. So some omega may look like this. In this case, it's smooth, more or less. So we start a Counterclockwise run along some smooth curve here. We 
may call this del he may call this del omega or just big gamma. And sometimes we also sometimes we may also use curves that look a bit different. Domains that look a bit different, like something like this, for example. Again, we run in counterclockwise direction, but perhaps the domain will only be piecewise. Will only be piecewise smooth. Keep in mind, always counterclockwise from now on. We have got an example of such a domain. Just some disk enclosed by, just some disk enclosed by a circle. And I've drawn here two vectors. So I would like to discuss the following two vectors again. So if you've got this curve here depicted in green, you can take a look again at the, at the tangential vector. So if you've got this curve, gamma going from A to B, going to R to the 2, and it has a tangential vector given as follows, gamma dot T. In the two-dimensional setting, it has got, only got two components, gamma dot 1T and gamma dot 2T. Now, the tangential vector tells you, okay, the direction of the curve, the, the tangential direction, but it also tells you the speed of the curve. So at some points, depending on how you parameterize the curve, it may be shorter or longer. For our purposes now, for what follows, we would like to have a unit tangential vector, which means we need to take the tangential vector, but we need to scale it to unit length. If you've got a vector, let's say it's a non-zero vector pointing in some direction, how do you get a vector in the same direction, but with unit length? Yeah, you divide, you take, if you want a unit length vector, you take a vector, let's say the tangential vector, and you divide it by the length. The fancy term for that is normalization. So the unit tangential vector at any point of the curve gamma t is obtained by normalization of the tangent gamma dot t. So a notation. In what follows, I will, use, I will write it like this, little tau. That's a unit tangential vector. It is written here, indicated already on the circle. And that's gamma t divided by its norm. We divide the vector by its size, and explicitly in terms of coordinates. You take the first coordinate and divide it by gamma dot t, and we take the second coordinate and we divide it by gamma dot t. Okay, so you got this curve that encloses some domain, and now this little tau, the little tau indicates the unit the tangential direction. Now, the unit tangent also got a brother, that is the unit normal, that goes in the opposite, in the perpendicular direction, in the orthogonal direction. This is actually quite simple, namely, you just take the unit tangent, you take the unit tangent and you rotate it by 90 degrees. If we rotate, if we rotate the unit tangent by 90 degrees in the clockwise direction, we get the following vector, namely the outward pointing unit vector. Outward pointing unit vector. Now, what is the that's depicted here, you can see it actually, but there's also a formula for rotating a vector. Namely, if this tau is given by T1 and T2, 
there's a formula how to rotate a vector in clockwise direction, namely n as depicted here. That n is given as n equal, the first component is negative t2. Yeah, it should be t2 positive. T2 and negative T1. So a short exercise. In this picture here, what is a, if that is a unit vector, if tau is a unit vector, what are the components? What's the first component? One. What's the second component? Zero. And if you just plug in the formula, okay, one zero, then the, normal, the unit normal will be zero negative one, which is exactly what we're seeing here. This can be a bit confusing if you keep in mind the formula. Generally speaking, what we've used here is given a vector from A to B, then rotating it clockwise in, by 90 degrees uses the formula B minus A. Okay. So, some basic definitions, unit tangent and unit normal. Let's do one example. You've done circles, no, let's, let's now instead do ellipses a bit, for, just for a change. So let omega be an ellipse, and the boundary of that ellipse is given as follows. Instead of describing the ellipse explicitly, we just say, what is the boundary? It's parameterized from 0 to 2 pi. Gamma goes from 0 to 2 pi. And t is mapped to the following point. Namely, this time it's 2 times cosine of t and sine of t. So very briefly, if I draw this in a coordinate system, for example, at t equals 0, I get the point 2, 0. Then I move up to 1, move down to negative 2, 0, and I get to 0 and negative 1. So I get this nicely shaped ellipse. One axis has radius 1, the other axis has got radius 2. I hope you can draw this better than, I, than, than me. Okay. Given that, we can now, we would like to see what are the unit, what are the unit tangent and the unit normal. The first thing to get there is computing, of course, the tangent. We get negative 2 sine of t and the cosine of t. Then since to get the tangent, and to, the unit tangent is the unit vector, blah, to get the unit tangent and the unit normal, we also need the size of the tangent. We need the speed. By definition, okay, that's just the square root of, in this case, for sine square of t, cosine square of t, plus cosine square of t. Whatever that is, we now can plug it in and get a formula for the tangent. So on the one hand, if I plug, plug in the formula, okay, I take the first component and divide it by the speed, which is some square root, and I take the second component and divide it by the speed, again, which is the, that square root. And if I want to get the unit normal, I just rotate it. In this case, okay, I take the first component. The first comp I take T2, put it in, that is gonna be my N1, cosine of T divided by that square root. And the second component will be negative of T1, which will be two sine of T. I think what will be a good exercise, I mean, we don't do it here, but you can take a few points on this ellipse and you can draw the tangent. Then you can see what does the unit tangent look like. Then you can see what does the unit normal look like. Just to get a bit of practice with that. Okay. That is the geometric background for now. So we have introduced domains. We have introduced, in particular, domains that are enclosed by simple closed curves, by simple closed curves in counterclockwise direction. 
And the two important notions here that we will use from now on are the unit tangent and the unit normal. Okay, we've got enough time to introduce a few integral theorems. So the whole point of this is, of that discussion is to, is to get to, to Green's theorem and the divergence theorem. Those will be our main theorems. So let's start with that. I think that's something we can get done. So the following results will be extremely central. We discuss the proof or raise some examples only later. So we use the following auxiliary theorem. That will be a theorem that relates integrals over a domain with integrals over a curve that encloses the domain. So, let omega be a two-dimensional domain. So omega is some bulk, some area inside two dimensions. That's a domain whose boundary del omega is a simple, closed, and piecewise regular curve. A simple and closed, maybe piecewise, maybe not, regular curve in, counter, in counterclockwise direction, in counterclockwise orientation. Now we take a look at a scalar field. Let's call it F. Let F be some scalar field in two dimensions. It takes x1 and x2 and maps it to f x1, x2. And we say it's differentiable, so we can take derivatives in x1 and x2. OK. Two results that we can already introduce here are as follows. We integrate over omega the x1 derivative of f x1, f x2. I can express this as that integral over this entire domain. I can express it as a curve integral along the boundary. Namely, it's a curve integral over the boundary of f against the first component of the unit, vec unit normal. And similarly, if I've got a derivative of a function only in the second component, if I've got the integral over omega of del x2, of blah, the integral over omega of the x2 derivative of f over this entire domain, that can be expressed as a line integral against the boundary of f multiplied with the second component of the unit out, of the outward pointing unit normal. That looks a bit technical because it actually is a bit technical. We will discuss it a bit, only a bit, we will discuss why that is true only later in the next lecture. But in the last minute, we will use these tools here, these auxiliary theorems, as building blocks. And as we use them as building blocks, we get the green theorem and the divergence theorem. And in fact, those will have a bit more physical intuition and also a bit more like, um, it, will be, it will be easier to visualize what is the meaning of behind the, the divergence theorem and the green theorem. Actually, we've got two minutes left, but I don't know how to fill the two minutes. So, do we have any questions? Let's say, are there any questions about this here? We still need to fill up two minutes. Okay, um, then keep in mind, maybe to recapitulate a little bit, keep in mind we have introduced the unit tangent, we've introduced the unit normal. It's very important to keep in mind how to rotate a vector. Given a vector in R to the 2 with two components, it's important that you know how to rotate it. Keep in mind that picture there, AB gets into B minus A. I suggest you try it out with a few vectors and see what it looks like. My impression from the exercises, by the way, is that many of you could benefit if you, uh, draw, these, if you draw the curves. That's something I've observed over and over again, that um, some confusion just arises that people don't draw, don't draw these curves. Okay, and now we will really finish. See you then.
quick question uh, regarding the last result that you wrote. Yeah. For Golden Max, is it significant or no? Is it um, I, I'm, I use different.